good morning or good evening or good afternoon to everybody out there on the internet, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, this is Bjorn Bjornholm. I'm coming to you live from Osaka, Japan at Kokan Nursery right now. It is 7 a.m. here in Japan, so nice and cold. I don't know if you guys can tell in the video, but it's actually snowing here right now. Um, what I'm going to do today is answer a few of your questions on Facebook Live here. So uh, I've teamed up again with Bonsai Empire and uh, we've got quite a few really good questions that have already come in online. So I'm going to answer those uh, to the best of my ability here. And uh, as I'm doing this, if you guys who are watching have any questions, please feel free to uh, toss those to me as well. And I'll try my best to get to those. Uh, we won't have time to get to everything. Uh, but I'll do my best to get to as many as possible. So the first question comes from Michael Bender. Uh, Michael Bender. Uh, and this is a, an easy toss-up question. It's, uh, as a professional, what is your favorite brand of tools? Uh, what tool do you find yourself reaching for the most? So I typically use uh, one of two brands, either Kaneshin, uh, which is a Japanese brand. It's spelled K-A-N-E-S-H-I-N. Um, or I use Kikua, which is also a Japanese brand, K-I-K-U-W-A. They have uh, really nice quality tools, relatively inexpensive, uh, and they uh, both companies have online stores uh, with English websites. So if you're interested in purchasing some of those tools, you can buy them direct from the companies online for reasonable prices. All right, let's scroll up here. <clears throat> So uh, the next question is from David Crust. He says, uh, maintaining the health of trees is uh, a paramount need to develop great bonsai. I completely agree. Uh, please share what you think uh, the essence of how to achieve this is. Well, this is a massively broad question and it would be too difficult to answer it directly on the video here. Um, so I'm gonna punt on this question at this point and tell you guys that if you want to find an answer to this question, every species is slightly different and requires uh, different maintenance techniques to uh, improve or develop or maintain the tree's health. So if you want to go to uh, bonsaiempire.com and sign up for our beginner and intermediate courses, you can find information about tons of different species there that will answer this question more directly than I could answer in a video. It would take us three hours just to talk about this one question here. So go to bonsaiempire.com and sign up for that to get more details uh, for that question. <clears throat> uh, next question is from Massimo Santoro. Uh, as a professional bonsai artist <clears throat> that travels around the globe, do you find the time for a personal bonsai collection? Um, not really. So I, I travel about seven months out of the year uh, all over the world. I'm still based in Japan. So I'm here five, six months out of the year and I'm on the road uh, six or seven months out of the year. So I do have a few trees that I maintain here uh, that are somewhat of a personal collection. Uh, they really are up for sale as well. Um, and then I also have material in the States uh, that uh, is maintained by someone else. So I do have a few trees um, and eventually I will settle down in the States and have my own nursery. So uh, the trees that are in the States will be maintained by me in the future. So not really at this point, I don't really have a personal collection, but sometime in the future, uh, I will set up a garden in the States and uh, that collection will grow. So, all right, <clears throat> let's see. Next question will go to, um, I'm not sure how you pronounce this, if it's Lee, Lei, Leif, I'm not sure. Uh, Garlic is the last name. Uh, Hi Bjorn, I've been loving the videos and online courses from you and Bonsai Empire. Thank you very much for checking those out. Uh, I live in Australia and have had uh, new growth on my maples in the middle of summer and the new young shoots drying up and dying. What might be the cause of this and how, how should I rectify the problem? Is it overwatering? Is it too hot during the day? Uh, what's the issue? Okay, <clears throat> so it could be any number of factors. My guess is uh, with the maples, if it's, if it's the new growth, uh, the new shoots that are drying up, uh, my guess is it's probably that the tree is getting overheated. It's getting too much direct sunlight uh, and maybe not enough water. If the shoots were uh, getting fungus on them and turning black and kind of shriveling up, but not necessarily drying out, they just look kind of gooey, then it would be a fungal problem. But this sounds like it's the opposite of that. So it sounds to me like you uh, may be putting them too much in direct sun. So if you can find a place where they can get at the very least afternoon shade and down where you are, it's pretty heavy duty sun. So maybe even some morning shade all the way through the afternoon uh, and perhaps more water. Uh, it depends on the soil that you're using as well. 
Um, but uh, that sounds to me like it might be the problem if it, in fact, is that the buds are, or the new shoots are drying out, shriveling up. It's probably a combination of too much direct sun and not enough water. All right, good question. Okay, uh, next question comes from uh, Michelle Benani Smyers. Uh, who are the most respected women bonsai cause? That's bonsai professionals or bonsai creators. Uh, I have not found many names uh, of whose work I can review. Do you have any thoughts on why men seem to predominate the art form? Uh, this is not a feminist related question. I am just curious. Uh, per perhaps there are more than I realize. Uh, thank you, appreciate your work. Cool, thank you for the question. Um, there aren't very many uh, women bonsai cause in Japan. Um, the only one who really comes to mind is uh, Mrs. Yamada. She's the um, second or third generation uh, owner of uh, Seiko End Nursery in the Omiya Bonsai Village. And she doesn't necessarily focus so much on bonsai as she does on kusamono or accent plants. But other than that, I am not familiar with really any uh, major bonsai professionals here in Japan who are women. I'm, I know of a few in Europe, uh, in a few different areas over there, um, but I'm not sure how many actually do bonsai professionally. Uh, they're just creators. So to answer the second question, though, do you have any thoughts on why men seem to predominate the art form? I don't know. That's a really good question. I've, I've thought about this myself, and I've had lots of other people ask me as well. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, it's, if it has to do with uh, the fact that bonsai can be a pretty dirty uh, practice, meaning that you're playing in the dirt and you're playing with bugs and getting your hands dirty. Um, for my wife, uh, my, my personal wife, she doesn't like bonsai because of the bugs and the dirt. So that may have something to do with it. Excuse me, something to do with it. <clears throat> but uh, I do know quite a few women who are interested in the kusamono aspect of it. So maybe it's uh maybe it has something to do to do with that but i'm not exactly sure how to answer that uh that question but it would be really nice to see more women uh involved in bonsai and particularly on the uh, professional level i think that'd be great all right <clears throat> next question comes from uh jean louis uh from france uh bjorn in europe uh japanese white pines are considered to be weak pines what are the techniques to have back budding and make them stronger uh, if you have any techniques, uh, are they applicable also to the kokon kokonoe white pine, uh, which seem to bud naturally uh, on the inside? Okay, so in general, you are right. Japanese white pines tend to be a slightly weaker pine, at least in terms of the root structure of the plant. So quite often what you'll see in Japan are uh, a couple of different things going on with the white pines. You'll see white pines that are uh, growing on their own root structure, and then you'll see white pines that have been grafted onto a black pine root structure. The reason that uh, white pine will get grafted to black pine root structure is because the black pine root structure is more stable and stronger than the natural white pine root structure. So um, if you have a white pine that is on its own roots, um, you will want to focus on that root structure as much as possible, meaning focus on fertilization to the root system, uh, getting the roots as healthy as possible, and subsequently you should be able to produce, uh, if not back budding, at least a profusion uh, of growth uh, on the top of the plant. Um, <clears throat> we cover quite a bit of this in the uh, online intermediate course at bonsaiempire.com, so you can look into that uh, if you'd like. Um, but to get Japanese white pines to back bud is not the easiest process in the world. Uh, it depends on the age of the tree. It depends on the health of the tree as well. Um, but heavy fertilization, um, fertilizing all year round is also another possibility. In doing so, you're going to get long needles on a white pine, but that shouldn't be too much of a worry at this stage. What you should be focused on is getting the tree healthier, getting back budding on the plant through fertilization by doing it all year round. And eventually, once you have the uh, amount of buds or back buds on the plant that you want, um, then you can start cutting the fertilization during the summer months and only fertilize in the fall or the autumn once the new growth for the year has completely hardened off. If you do it that way, those needles that would have gotten longer during the full year fertilization process will eventually shorten over time. So it's a two-stage process with white pines. Heavy fertilization all year round for at least a few years to get as much back budding and profusion of growth as possible, then cutting that fertilizer during the growing season in subsequent years. Okay, uh, let's see here. All right, got a question from Pierre. Uh, it says, hi Bjorn, my question is probably absurd. Uh, I've lost eight of my trees in the last two weeks. That does not sound good. 
Uh, they seem to have dried out as if I had put vinegar instead of water. I live in Montreal. Is it possible that the city water has caused my trees to die? I have no idea. That could be the case. Um, it, I have no idea what kind of soil you have the trees potted in or how often uh, you've watered the trees. Um, since you're in Montreal, I, my guess is, yeah, you're going into to winter or you're already into winter at this point. So quite often what happens going into the winter with watering is that people get a little careless with, with watering uh, in a proper amount of time. Um, doing it on a regular basis. Most people think, oh, the tree's not growing that much. I don't have to water it that much. That's true, but you still have to check every day to make sure that the tree uh, doesn't need to be watered or does need to be watered uh, and then water accordingly. So it could potentially be that the city water caused that problem, but if you had been using the city water up until then, I can't see that it would have switched that quickly, that something would have been dumped into the water to have caused that. So it might have something to do with um, the way you've been watering uh, as the trees have gone dormant. So just keep in mind that two of the most dangerous times for water are going to be in the spring as new growth is coming out because the trees are sucking up a lot of water. And then in the fall as you're going into winter, judging when to water uh, as the trees go dormant. So regardless of the temperatures outside and regardless of whether or not it has rained, you're going to want to make sure that you check the water every day. Right? It doesn't mean you have to water every day, but check the trees every day to make sure they do or don't need water. Okay. All right. This uh, question is from Tom uh, Krugel. Sorry if I butchered your last name there. Uh, when making a drastic change in planting angle, how best should you handle the portion of root ball that winds up above uh, the pot rim? Right, so quite often when we restyle a bonsai, uh, it could be a tree that's already been well developed or it could be a tree straight out of the mountains that we really need to do a severe angle change on. Quite often the roots will need to be tilted on such an angle that they stick out of the pot. The best thing to do um, is in most cases not overly prune that area that's sticking out of the soil but rather leave that for the time being and then cover it with a layer of sphagnum moss. What we typically do here is take a, uh, a sieve that we would normally sieve soil with to get the fine particles out, take a block of dry sphagnum and run it over that sieve like a cheese grater. And that'll break up the, uh, the sphagnum moss and then you can um, soak it in water and put a very thin layer, say, uh, you know, probably three to four millimeters or so. So about an eighth of an inch, maybe even a quarter of an inch layer over the top of that root ball that's sticking out of the soil and that should keep that area relatively moist and over time as you subsequently repot the tree you can slowly shave that uh, area of the root ball that's sticking out of the surface of the soil down little by little. Um, I'll see if I can find an example of that uh, at the end of the video. We'll walk out to the garden and I'll show you guys some of the trees out there um, and if there is an example of that I'll point it out as we go. Okay. This next question comes from uh, Steve uh, Hersey. Uh, Hi Bjorn, I'm in the UK and have issues with green algae growing on the foliage and smaller branches of evergreen juniper, pines, etc. Just wondering if you experience the same issue in Japan. If you do, what methods uh, do you use to remove the algae? Okay, so in the UK, um, my guess is that you have uh, a relatively wet climate, so this is probably what's causing the issue uh, on your trees, uh, your uh, evergreen uh, coniferous trees with the algae. So there are a couple ways to get rid of that. Probably the easiest way uh, and perhaps the cheapest way is going to be to use uh, lime sulfur, actually. So what I recommend is uh, diluting lime sulfur, a solution of lime sulfur, down to about 20%, so 20% lime sulfur, 80% water, and spraying that on your trees, on the foliage, the trunks, everywhere, that will take care of not only the algae on the tree, but any other um, uh, fungus or any other pests that might be on the plant. And that's actually a great uh, dormant spray. The only problem with using uh, lime sulfur to do that is it's gonna turn the tree somewhat of a whitish type color. Um, so you're gonna wanna make sure that uh, you don't overdo it in terms of the solution, so 20% should be about right. And then when the tree does turn white, don't worry about that because it will slowly disappear over the course of the winter into the following spring as the tree starts to green up uh, and the natural rain and whatnot uh, washes that off. In addition to that, because your climate is somewhat wet, 
I would try to protect the trees from the wet weather. So if you have like a cold frame where you can keep the moisture off the trees, but still allow the trees to stay dormant, I would put them in something like that. Um, so that should be probably the easiest and best way to take care of that problem. Now, we don't really have that problem here in Japan because our, our rainy season is actually in June here and we use certain fungicides to take care of any fungal issues that we have during that time of year. But this time of year in the uh, autumn into the, the uh, winter, our climate here is relatively dry. So we don't have to worry too much about that here. Okay, let's go up here. <laughs> Okay, this next question comes from uh, Frank Hovenden. Uh, Hi Bjorn, I live on Vancouver Island where we have extreme amounts of winter rain. Uh, I have concerns about Akadama being broken down quickly under these conditions. Do you have any recommendations with respect to suitable soil mixtures or perhaps moving my bonsai under cover? So this question is semi-related to the last one. Um, if you are able to build a cold frame where you can keep the moisture off the trees, uh, but still allow the trees to stay dormant. Uh, that's the uh, probably the, the best way to start out. Um, in terms of the Akadama being broken down, you are correct that the water will break down that Akadama faster than if it wasn't so rainy. Um, if you wanted to switch up the soil mix a bit, you could use less Akadama or completely remove the Akadama from the soil and just use say pumice and lava rock. The only issue with that is, uh, is that if during the subsequent summer you don't have that much rain, you're going to have to water more frequently and also you're going to have to fertilize more often because the point of the Akadama is not only uh, as a water retention component but also as a fertilizer retention component. So it'll absorb more of that fertilizer uh, and hold it into the soil longer so that the tree can absorb it over a longer period of time. So. If you remove that Akadama or at least decrease the percentage that you use in your soil mix, you're going to have to fertilize more often and a bit heavier uh, and also water more frequently in the summer. But that may help you in the winter uh, if you've got a lot of uh, rain like you have in your area. The other thing you could do, like I just mentioned earlier, is you could build a cold frame where you put the tree in that and keep the winter rain off the plant. And then you can go back to using your regular mix of Akadama pumice and lava rock in whatever combination uh, percent, percentage wise that you want to use. And regarding that, what we typically do with, uh, with uh, coniferous uh, species in most cases is a one third, one third, one third mix of Akadama pumice and lava rock. And that gives you a porous mix, but with enough water retention and fertilizer retention, uh, retention component in the Akadama. And with deciduous and broadleaf evergreen trees, in most cases we use 50% Akadama and then 25%, 25% of pumice and lava rock. So that gives you a bit more water retention and fertilizer retention uh, in the soil. So you'll have to adjust one or the other, either building something to keep the trees in or adjusting the amount of Akadama you put in the soil. Okay, uh, next question is from Robert, uh, Robert Pressler. Hey Robert, how you doing? Um, Hey Bjorn, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too. Oh, and Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everybody out there watching. Um, my question for you is what do you do uh, to a juniper that has put out lots of juvenile foliage? Is there any way to make it change back to mature? Okay, so normally what happens if a juniper has reverted to juvenile foliage is it's done it in response to some uh, stress stimuli. So for example, over pruning the tree, or overpruning the root structure on the plant. Um, any number of things can affect that. And really what that is, is an evolutionary response uh, to what would happen in nature, say if an animal came through and ate the foliage off of the tree. So what happens is the, an animal come through, they'll eat the foliage, the tree will put out that juvenile spiky foliage in response to that to deter the animal from coming back to eat the tree again. Right, so it gives it a chance to revert back to its or to its adult foliage, right? So if you have a lot of juvenile foliage on a juniper, don't cut that off, leave that foliage there, because over time from the tip of that juvenile foliage, it will start to revert back to adult foliage. That may take one growing season, three growing seasons, five growing seasons. Um, normally it takes about one to two growing seasons and you'll start to see a reversion back to adult foliage. But the main point is when you see juvenile foliage, do not cut it off, uh, let the uh, tree grow, and then from the tips it will revert back to adult foliage, right? Okay. 
All right, next question is from uh, Ruby Rod or Ruby uh, Road. Um, okay, yeah. So, hey Bjorn, uh, Jake here from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I wanted to ask about your approach to carving. Uh, how do you go about creating a natural look? What power and hand tools do you recommend using slash needing? Uh, I know you do not recommend dead wood uh, on softwood species. However, sometimes it's the best call, i.e. with collected material and can add dramatically to a design. Uh, softwoods are harder to carve convincingly, so what would be your process doing this and what should the aftercare consist of? Thanks. <clears throat> okay, good question. Um, I prefer not to do carving if I don't have to. I don't like carving. Uh, if I have to do carving though, I try to use only hand tools uh, and not power tools. It's very difficult to create a natural look with power tools, so I use mostly small chisels um, in any number of shapes to the end of them to get sort of a natural type look uh, to the carving. Um, with regards to softwood trees, say like deciduous trees or some, some broadleaf evergreen trees, in most cases, if you can avoid having dead wood on the trunk, you're better off because it will rot very, very quickly. So if you are going out into nature and collecting trees, uh, softwood trees, and you're chopping them down and you're getting these big scars on the plant, where it sort of kills part of the trunk and then hollows itself out naturally. If at all possible, I would recommend trying to get those areas to heal over. Um, sometimes it's difficult to do, but what we often do here uh, is put certain kinds of cement inside the trunks or inside the wounds on soft, uh, softwood trees. And then we start to uh, see the uh, callus, callus over the top of that cement. And you can eventually get a nice smooth surface so that the trunk is solid for the most part. Um, I recommend doing that rather than carving those trees because whatever you carve on that plant, it'll be gone in three, four, five years because it's a softwood tree and it rots very quickly. So I don't recommend that you do that. I think that people um, all over the world, it's, you know, it's just human nature, I think, to want sort of fast-paced, almost instant gratification and going out into the woods or into the mountains and collecting a softwood tree, chopping it down, trunk chopping it, growing out a leader, doing this and that, gets you a fat trunk to start with, but you're never gonna get the look of the trees that you see here in Japan in terms of deciduous plants, right? Let me let me show you guys an example here, right? If you, if you want to design a deciduous tree and do it properly, really you should be growing it from seedling or from cutting or from an air layer right from the start uh, and then building on that. So I don't know if you guys can see this tree right behind me here, this is a shishigashira, Japanese maple. This is probably one of the best ones in all of Japan, right? This tree was exclusively grown in a container, right? And it's been in a container for probably about 60 or 70 years, a really, really, really long time. So you're never going to get this type of movement, this type of taper, no scarring on the trunk, perfect branch placement, uh, and beautiful sort of elegant look to the tree without growing it exclusively in a pot. Right, So I don't recommend that you go out and collect softwood trees. I don't think that that is, uh, is the best approach. I would recommend that you, if you're going to grow softwood trees like deciduous plants uh, or some broadleaf evergreens, that you do it exclusively in a pot. It takes forever to develop a tree like that, but the results make all of the effort worth it. Right, It'll take from the time that you start to develop something that you can perhaps show uh, minimum probably 18 to 20 years and that sounds like a really long time but if you do it properly and you think long term you can create material like that or at least moving towards that so I'd like to see more people do that around the world but it's going to take sort of a shift in uh, in perspective on long term versus short term uh, goals okay <clears throat> All right, so next question comes from uh, Randy Rader. Uh, my question is, what is the best way to care and protect uh, my deciduous and uh, coniferous trees during the winter months? I live in West Virginia, which is about a zone 6A to 6B, uh, and we do get some pretty harsh freezing and windy periods. Uh, thanks for all the videos and information you provide for us. Love your work. Cool, thank you very much. Thanks for the question. Um, I get asked this question quite a bit, and Actually, in previous questions today, we sort of hinted at this, but um, I would recommend that if you can build uh, a cold frame 
um, or even a, uh, a greenhouse that you can keep at a relatively low temperature, say somewhere between 35 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is gonna be, what, about two, two to four degrees Celsius, somewhere in that range. If you can keep a, a greenhouse consistently at that low temperature, that's your best way to overwin overwinter your trees if you live in an area where it's very cold. And that, that's somewhat cold. Um, you know, obviously the further north you get, the worse it's gonna get. Um, but if you can keep the trees right, just right above freezing uh, in a cold frame or a hot house uh, or a greenhouse, that's going to be your best option. Um, that may not be feasible for everybody uh, to build a, a facility like that. So at the very least, if you have an unheated basement or an unheated garage that keeps the temperature somewhat in that range, you know, right at freezing or slightly above, uh, that would be your best bet. If that uh, room heats up during the day, perhaps you might want to move the trees in and out on a mobile cart. So in the evening when it gets really cold, you can put the trees in the unheated garage or unheated basement. And during the day when it's going to heat up, you can move it outside so that it gets those low temperatures outside instead of heating up in the room. So those are two options that, uh, that I would recommend for that. Okay. <clears throat> so I've got a question from Philip. Uh, Philip. Philip, how you doing? Philip was one of our students here at the uh, Fujikawa International School a few years ago, so hope you're doing well. Um, the question is, with Japanese white pines, uh, you reduce or delay the amount of fertilizer during the growing season to keep the needles short. Is there a difference in doing so with Japanese white pine grafted on Japanese black pine versus Japanese white pine on its own rootstock? Uh, in other words, uh, standard white pine versus Setsugoyo or Miyajima. Um, not really. Um, the approach is basically the same. If the goal is uh, to get the tree back into better health, um, say for example, the tree has declined in health, you can heavily fertilize, like I mentioned earlier, all year round with either uh, Japanese white pine on its own root base or grafted on a black pine root base. And that'll help get the tree back into better condition. And then once you get the tree um, with as much back budding as you need on it and as much foliar density as you need on it, uh, then you can cut the fertilizer during the growing season on both types of trees. So white pine grafted on its own root, or grafted on black pine rootstock and white pine on its own root base. You can treat them essentially the same. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. All right, next question is from Matt Ruff. Uh, he says, uh, my question actually refers to maintaining the shape of Japanese white pine. Lots of white pine questions today. Um, I, I've had my white pine for several years now, and it shows a nice ramification, uh, tertiary and beyond. Uh, accordingly, I would like to keep its shape. Um, the standard procedure would probably say something like cut back the candles, select the buds, pluck the needles, etc. Now here comes the problem. My white pine doesn't produce any candles. That's not good. Uh, it just opens a bouquet of new needles each year over the last year. Uh, thus, I probably get half an inch of additional length to each branch, which is great as it slowly outgrows the desired shape, but of course over the years this adds up. So how can I keep the new growth under control in order not to end up with a gangly overgrown tree soon? Do I just cut? Do I just have to cut off any elongated twigs to shorter ones that are more inside, or do I have to fertilize more to induce back budding and then gradu gradually reduce uh, to inner uh, parts of the twigs of the tree? Okay. <clears throat> So um, that is one of the biggest issues with white pines is that they don't tend to back bud very easily. Uh, so over time you get the tip growth and it just elongates and elongates and elongates. So a couple of things you can do. Um, first, as I mentioned before, you can heavily fertilize all year round to try to induce back budding on the tree. There's no guarantee that that's gonna happen. If that doesn't happen, you can always scion graft further back towards the trunk uh, to create back budding on the plant by cutting off tip growth and then scion, growth, uh, scion grafting with that. It's another option. Um, and if you're going to do that, probably the best time to do it is late February to early March in the Northern Hemisphere, which is uh, late winter, uh, early spring. Um, uh, another option um, would be, uh, and we do this quite often design-wise, is uh, the lower branches on the plant, actually all the branches are going to elongate over time. But the lower branches, uh, ideally, in most uh, shapes, are going to be slightly longer than the branches above it. So as those lower branches get too long, you can remove them completely, then take the branches that are above those lowest branches and drop them down. 
right? That'll shrink the profile of the tree so you can maintain the overall size of the plant with fewer and fewer branches. So if you look at a lot of, say, the Kokufu books, the Japanese National Exhibition books, say from 50 years ago and the ones from more recently, you'll see some of the same trees in those, excuse me, in those books. Notice where the branches are placed. On quite, quite often, especially on conifers, a lot of the lower branches will have either been killed off or had, have died off, and branches from above will have been brought down to fill in that same uh, negative space. So the trees... They're physically older, but they look much, much, much older design-wise because those lowest branches have been cut off and the upper branches have been brought down. So that's another way to maintain the overall profile of the tree uh, if you can't get back budding or if you're just not very proficient with grafting. Uh, that's a third option in terms of maintaining the overall design on the tree. We talk a little bit about this in our online course at bonsaiempire.com, uh, particularly the intermediate course. So if you're interested, go check that out. Um, you can sign up for that on, on bonsaiempire.com. Okay. <clears throat> uh, okay. So I've got another question here from Dean Kelly. He says, uh, I'm a fan of the very refined finish you and others like you achieve with your bonsai, uh, but have you received much in the way of negativity from those who prefer a more untouched finish? Um, also, have you received much phrase uh, or much issue from the older generations about uh, promotional work with the art? Uh, so to answer the first question, um, you know, here, here at Kokaen, um, we tend to refine trees to a very detailed level. And there's a fine line between over refinement or refinement and a plastic look to the tree. There's a very fine line between the two. Right, so I try to balance that line as well as I can. Some people prefer a bit more of what they call a natural look to the tree, but the way that I style a tree here, when I say post it online and you see a photo of it, is not really the final goal of that plant. So when I style a tree that looks somewhat over refined, the idea is that in the subsequent growing season, the tip growth is going to slightly elongate and raise up just a little bit. So you get this very refined but more natural type look to the plant. So that's my goal in styling a tree that way. Some people will style it too flat, too overdone, and it looks very plasticky, but that may not be the ultimate goal with that tree. It may be that they're wanting to let it grow out for a season and get more of a lift on the plant. The problem is if you style a tree to look natural yet refined, where you, instead of making it somewhat flat, you do more of a natural type look to it, within a couple of weeks, a month, a couple of months, it's gonna look like a total mess. Right? As that new growth elongates, it's going to look terrible and you're going to have to go back and fix it again. So doing it the way we do it here allows for a bit longer uh, development period um, so that the tree looks you know, nice and clean and refined for a longer period of time um, rather than trying to create that natural look uh, right from the start, in which case you're going to end up with a lot of developmental problems uh, and it's going to be a mess in a shorter amount of time. Uh, regarding your second question, have you received much uh, issue from older generations about promoting your work? Uh, I do get some backlash from some people about promoting online, but that's the way that the world is working right now. Hence, doing this Facebook Live thing, I and mean, we've got hundreds and hundreds of people commenting as I'm talking here. So my goal is to promote bonsai in any way that I possibly can. And if that requires signing up for every new app that comes out, you know, with the new generations wanting something new every five minutes, then I'll sign up for that new app and I'll promote the work on there. Because the goal is to get as many people in the world involved in bonsai as possible. I want as many people to know about this awesome art around the world as I can possibly introduce uh, to the art. So I really don't tend to listen too much to that negativity. Um, I just post my work. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. And that's okay. Right? Everybody's got their own personal preference. Okay. All right, <clears throat> we've got a question here from Marcus. He says, uh, hi mate, hope all is going well. Which deciduous species benefit from full defoliation and which species would you totally avoid doing this on? Okay, so <clears throat> in our intermediate course at bonsaiempire.com, we break this down uh, very simply. Uh, but just to give you sort of a general overview, um, what I tend to do is break species up into categories based on growth patterns. So we've got alternating leaf pattern trees, we've got opposite leaf pattern trees, and then we've got world leaf pattern trees. 
right? So the opposite leaf pattern trees would be something like a Japanese maple, a trident maple, right? The alternating leaf pattern trees would be almost all other deciduous trees. You're talking, you know, your beeches, your hornbeams, stewardia, flowering apricot, right? And within each of those categories, you have certain species that can be defoliated and certain species that cannot be defoliated, right? <clears throat> So it, at that point, it's just a matter of understanding which ones can and can't be defoliated. There is no, uh, no sort of categorization within that. So for example, within the opposite leaf pattern trees, the say trident maples, Japanese maples, you can defoliate trident maples easily, no problem. Japanese maples, I don't recommend doing it because the second flush of growth, sometimes you'll get very small leaves, sometimes you'll get huge leaves, uh, sometimes branches won't put out new growth at all and they'll die off. So you completely destroy the energy balance on the tree. Right. There are exceptions to that, uh, but as a general rule of thumb, that's how we approach it. If you're talking about the alternating leaf pattern trees, the hornbeams, the beeches, stewardia, flowering apricot, certain species can and can't be defoliated within that category as well. So for example, flowering apricot uh, or stewardia, those can be defoliated in May, or at least partially defoliated, no problem. They'll flush out again, the growth will be consistent, and the energy balance will still be there. If you were to do that to most hornbeams or most beeches uh, and a few other species, the second flush of growth is going to be similar to a Japanese maple if you defoliate it. You're going to get big leaves here, small leaves there, and some branches uh, are going to be uh, are going to die, right? So you just have to make sure that you understand each of those categories. And the best way to do that is to sign up for our online course, uh, especially the intermediate course at bonsaiempire.com, because all of that information is broken up. On there so okay um, I'm gonna stop answering questions at this point but I'm gonna take you guys out into the garden real quick and show you some of the trees that we have here uh, and then we'll close out this session of Facebook live so um, I'll take you guys out show you some of the new acquisitions uh, that we just got here at the nursery let's see I don't know if you guys can see that here this is a nice medium-sized shimpaku juniper really really cool plant it's actually grafted so I, I believe that the tree itself is probably tohoku shimpaku or hokkaido shimpaku something from way up north because of how thick and hard the deadwood is but the foliage is a nice fine itoigawa so it's been grafted really really cool tree all right that one right there you can see that's a new one that just came into the nursery recently um, you can actually see uh, the acquisition of this tree on my vlogs. If you go to youtube.com uh, and type in my name, Bjorn Bjornholm, you can follow my vlogs on there. I put them up every week and you can see us picking up this tree up north at a nursery. So really, really sweet uh, shimpaku there. Um, I'll show you one more time the, uh, the uh, shishigashira right there. Really cool tree as well. Um, right now, that's one of my favorite trees in the nursery. And if anybody overseas is in, interested in buying that, we uh, we can't export it. So you know, let me know. It's uh, very expensive. <laughs> so um, we'll go around the corner here. All right, this is a nice uh, needle juniper right here. Very cool tree. Uh, this one is not owned by a customer yet. It's still up for sale, but we're hoping to take this up to the Kokofu in about a month and a half and sell it up there. So uh, this particular tree could easily be in the Kokofu itself, no problem. Um, but as of right now, it's, it's up for sale. Uh, let's see, do a couple more here. You can see this one here. The, uh, the trunk on this one is actually a needle juniper and it's been grafted with Itoigawa foliage. So the original tree itself um, was worth tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars. It started to deteriorate, so it was grafted with this nice fine Itoigawa foliage, um, and now it's starting to fill back in and starting to look quite nice. So this tree has a really good future, I think. Give it another five, six, seven years when it's fully developed, should be absolutely excellent. All right, we'll do one more here. See how big this Japanese maple is? That's my hand here. I'm six foot six, so standing next to the tree, you can see just how big it is. It's huge, right? We just picked this one up on our uh, recent buying trip last week as well. So this is another one that we're hoping to take up uh, to the Kokofu uh, in about a month. So, all right, I'm gonna end this uh, Facebook Live session right here. Uh, thank you to everybody out there for checking it out and for sticking around and submitting your questions. Uh, we'll be doing another one of these in not too long, but in the meantime, if you want to sign up uh, for our intermediate or beginner course at bonsaiempire.com, you can pick up many more uh, tips and a lot more information there. So 
Thank you again for uh, stopping in and we'll see you guys next time.